Hey there, I'm Deanne Rosso with Elevate Wealth Advisory, and today I'm here to share with you some information about Secure Act 2.0 and specifically the provisions that become effective in 2024. So Secure Act 2.0 was passed in December of 2022 with the goal of making retirement more achievable for Americans. So while there was really no big change from a financial planning perspective, the bill included lots of little things that can add up to a big difference over time for those who are planning for or even that are already in retirement. So today I'm focusing on provisions that become effective in 2024. At Elevate, we've rolled out a couple of other videos uh, relating to provisions that become effective in 2023 or in 2025 and beyond. So feel free to check those out if you're interested um, in the different provisions that are rolled out over those timeframes. Um, and today we're focused on Secure Act 2.0 provisions effective in 2024. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to start by sharing my um, screen with you to show you a summary uh, document that we're utilizing. Let me make it a little bigger. There we go. Um, so this is a really neat summary document um, regarding changes made by the SECURE Act 2.0 and when these different changes are rolled out. So I want to highlight today, of course, as I've mentioned, planning issues that become effective in 2024. So I'm going to zoom in a bit so we can see specifically um, some of these issues. So some questions to ask yourself as we think about how Secure Act 2.0 might impact you. First of all, do you or will you have extra funds in a 529 plan? I have a lot of clients with young children who ask me about funding 529 plans and who may be concerned about overfunding those 529 plans if their children don't go to college um, or you know, have scholarships um, and they don't wanna pump a ton of money into a 529 that may or may not get used for education. So um, I think this is one of the coolest provisions of the Secure Act 2.0, which is allowing 529 to Roth IRA transfers. So the way it works is uh, you can begin putting, you can take funds uh, that you have put into a 529 plan um, for a beneficiary, and you can transfer those funds from the 529 into the Roth IRA, as long as you follow some specific set of rules. So those ro rules are um, the transfer from the 529 to the Roth IRA can only be made to the 529 beneficiary. So if you know, child number one is named as the beneficiary of the 529 plan, then a Roth IRA has to be established for child number one and the, the child's 529 assets can go to their Roth IRA. Um, the account must have been maintained for 15 years. So that's a big one um, because, again, you know, lots of uh, my clients ask me about funding 529s, concern that, you know, 15 years down the road, they uh, the account would be overfunded. So I believe that this is why they put this provision in that um, the account must have been maintained for 15 years. Um, because that way, you know, at that point, um, if you have extra funds in those 529s that you would like rolled over into um, a Roth IRA for that beneficiary. And then another important rule here is the annual transfer is limited to no more than the annual IRA contribution limit in that year. So on the our reference card here, it says be mindful of the $6,500 annual transfer limit. That is the annual um, limit for IRA or Roth IRA contributions for 2023. So whatever the annual transfer limit is in that year is what you're going to be limited to. So if that limit goes up by inflation for 2024, then that's the annual transfer limit um, that you will be subject to when in 2024 you start these uh, 529 to Roth IRA transfers. There is a lifetime maximum. So they've set that at $35,000 per beneficiary for now. We'll see, uh, time will tell if they increase that limit if it stays at 35,000. You can't transfer contributions made in the last five years. Now, why is that important? And that's important because let's say that you're a young family who's just had children 
If you go ahead and you start the 529 as soon as your kids are young um, or your grandkids or, or other family members, um, but, but when they're young, it starts the time clock ticking for both the 15 year clock that you have to maintain the account and getting those contributions in early means that you'll avoid the five-year rule where you can't transfer contributions made in the last five years. So starting early is important. There's no income limits. And as long as that holding has been met, this should be a provision that you can start beginning in 2024. Next question, as an employee, do you plan to make catch-up contributions to your employer's retirement plan and are your wages over 145000 And why is that important, 145000 It's because beginning next year or in 2024 under Secure Act 2.0, if you're a high wage earner, meaning your wages are over 145000 next year, then you can only contribute your catch-up contributions into a Roth 401k portion of your account. This is new. Um, up until now, catch-up contributions, which are the extra amount of salary deferral you're able to do over age 50. Uh, catch-up contributions have been able to go into your pre-tax account or your Roth 401k if that was an option for you. But beginning next year in 2024, as an employee, if you make more than $145,000, then your catch-up contributions must be made to a Roth account, and you do not get a tax deduction for that. So just something to be mindful of um, if that impacts you, that beginning next year, if you make your catch-up contributions and you make over one forty-five, dollars then you won't be able to make those pre-tax any longer. Okay, next. Do you have a younger spouse that you anticipate may predecease you, for example, from a terminal illness, family longevity issues, et cetera, and also has a retirement plan you may inherit? Now, never fun to talk about um, health situations or other issues that may affect our longevity. But um, if you do, if you are married to someone who's facing a terminal illness or they have longevity issues, um, and they're younger than you, then this uh, Secure Act 2.0 allows a surviving spouse to take required minimum distributions as if they were the deceased spouse, which means they can delay their required minimum distribution until the person who died would have had to take the required distribution and also utilize their deceased spouse's age on the uniform lifetime table, which is the table that's used to calculate the RMDs or the required minimum distributions. So the example here is think about if you are a surviving spouse or you anticipate being a survivor spouse and your deceased spouse is much younger than you. And that's when this type of provision would apply to your situation. So just important to know um, for, for planning purposes or just for your knowledge purposes that that is something that's available if that is your situation. Okay, next, do you have a Roth retirement plan? So some retirement plans offer the Roth provision. I think we're going to see that more and more as we go on, that 401ks, 403bs, et cetera, have that Roth retirement plan. And one of the provisions of Secure 2.0 is the elimination of required minimum distributions for that type of account. So in the past, the rule has been that if you have a Roth um, or if you have any funds in your retirement account and you reach required minimum distribution age, um, as long as you were still working, you did not need to take a required minimum distribution um, from um, from your retirement plan. Um, and so um, now with Secure Act 2.0, um, Roth RMDs have been eliminated um, from 401k and 403bs. So that's a nice function to consider if you are still working by the time you reach age 73 or age 75, which um, we know from um, the effective date of 2023 that those required minimum distribution ages have changed. So um, just something to note that if you have a Roth retirement plan, you no longer have to take a required minimum distribution from your Roth 
um, side of your retirement plan if you um, continue to hold on to that plan um, after you've retired or while you're still working. Okay, go on on to page two of our planning issues uh, for 2024. There are some provisions for hardship, emergencies, and life situations um, that um, we can find really helpful in Secure Act 2.0. So for example, um, scrolling back up here, um, do you need to make a non-hardship emergency withdrawal, for example, for unexpected expenses from your retirement plan? And what we mean by that is in the past, um, or 401k plans have what's called hardship provisions, and there are certain um, limitations to what types of situations you can use for a hardship withdrawal. So when it says non-hardship, it's probably very much a hardship for you, but if it doesn't meet the qualifications of what um, the Department of Labor says is a hardship, then you weren't able to take a withdrawal from your retirement plan. Well, Secure Act 2.0 um, has allowed access to up to $1,000 penalty-free from your retirement plan to be used for emergency expenses, and it doesn't have to meet that um, ERISA definition of hardship. So be mindful of any applicable limitations. And that is you can only do it once per year and you can't use it again until you've paid it back or three years have passed. Um, but it does allow in an emergency situation for you to access up to $1,000. Be mindful though that when it says penalty-free, it is penalty-free, but not, not necessarily income tax-free. Um, so just note that taxes may apply. Secure Act 2.0 also um, added a provision for victims of domestic abuse. And if you have been a victim of domestic abuse and you need to access the funds in your retirement plan, you may be eligible to access up to $10,000 or 50% of your balance, whichever is less. Um, and that again, that's penalty free, not tax free, um, but penalty free um, with a self certification with your employer. Um, and then next, does or will your employer offer the new emergency savings account as part of your retirement plan benefits? So another new provision of Secure Act 2.0, the emergency savings account. And this is something that plan employers can offer if they'd like to. And you can save up to $2,500 into an emergency fund. So this is designed to complement your overall emergency savings goals, but sometimes it's easier when we set aside emergency savings and completely a place where we, we don't feel like we can access it very easily, and sometimes that's in a retirement plan. So this emergency savings account allows you to, um, as part of your contributions, to add up to $2,500 um, to an account that you could use for emergency savings fund and or to meet your savings goals. Um, we'll, we will see when uh, 2024 rolls around, um, how many, uh, what are the provisions, how many employers decide to add this benefit to their plans if it becomes a requirement. Um, all of that, I'm sure over the next year will be discussed and figured out before 2024 rolls around. Um, but that could be a really nice provision in order to help folks save for emergencies. Okay, do you currently have student loans? If so, consider whether taking advantage of the newly allowed employer match on student loan payments makes sense for your situation. So think about this. If you've graduated from college um, or graduate programs or qualified educational programs with student loans and you're beginning your career or your midstream career, whatever level of career you're in, um, and you go to work and you have to choose, you know, I, I would like to put money in my retirement plan, but I'd also like to save for a house and I also have to save, uh, pay back my student loans. And, you know, as financial planners, we all know there's only so many dollars to go around. And where does it make the most sense to utilize those resources? So this is a provision that will allow employers to match on folks who are paying back student loan payments. So let's consider that maybe um, this, this college grad um, wants to, uh, needs to, will be paying back their student loans, but they don't necessarily have quite enough left in the budget to add to a retirement plan as well. Well, they may be missing out on an employer match if they don't add to their retirement account. 
So this will allow someone to make their student loan payments and then for their employer to add an employer match for them to a retirement plan so that they don't miss out on that employer match at the same time as they're paying back their student loans and potentially saving for other things. So it's a really nice provision to help younger, typically younger um, students, uh, graduates who are entering the workforce and who have student loans begin to save for retirement and don't get behind on retirement savings just because they are paying back their student loans. All right. And the last two here um, for 2024 are uh, regarding retirement plans. Are you a business owner planning to start a new or make changes to an existing retirement plan? And are you considering establishing a retirement plan for your business for the prior tax year? And are you a sole proprietor? So these provisions clearly apply to business owners or sole proprietors, and it's just a really good idea. There are lots of new, again, little changes to retirement plans that are built into Secure Act 2.0, and those can be very different depending on your business, depending on what type of business structure, how many employees you have, and those types of things. So as a, a business owner who has an existing plan, Always a good idea annually to review the plan and see if it is meeting the goals that you'd like the plan to meet. But of course, if you're thinking about starting a new plan, let's think about all the new provisions that are available and what my plan might work best for you and your business. And if you're a sole proprietor, um, one thing that has changed with Secure Act 2.0 is the ability to retroactively establish a 401k plan, which in the past you had not been able to do that retroactively. So now you have until um, your personal tax filing deadline, if you're a sole proprietor or an LLC taxed as a sole proprietor, in order to get a tax deduction for the prior year. So, so many things to think about, so many ways that planning can be effective when it comes to how to secure Act 2.0 work for you and your personal situation. And like with every everything regarding financial planning, it is so important uh, just to have a review of what is your personal situation and how do these issues affect you. Um, so if you would like a copy of uh, this document, or um, if you would like to talk more about your specific planning issues, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, you can visit our website at elevate-wealth.com, and you can find us on the Contact Us feature to request a copy of this document um, or start a conversation. Thank you so much, and have a great year.